There we go. Okay, so um, Ruby and Rails. What is the difference between the two? Uh, we're going to go into some just very, very basics of Ruby as well as some basics of Rails architecture. Just some ideas behind the designs of um, why they did some of the, some of the things that they did. Um, and we're going to finish up with uh, some of the workspace of Rails um, and how you might want to set up your own development environment. Uh, so Ruby versus Rails. Ruby is a programming language. It's like C Sharp or Java, C++, um, if you use any of those, Python, <coughs> Scheme, Lisp. Um, it can be used really to program anything you want. Um, it's very expressive. You can, if you've never, if you haven't opened your book yet and actually seen Ruby, uh, you can read it relatively easily. Um, and Rails is a framework that's actually built on top of Ruby. Rails uh, is meant uh, to code web pages, uh, dynamic web pages, like Gowalla, like Twitter, um, I mentioned Urban Dictionary earlier. Those are just a few. Uh, the whole idea is that you want to focus on your app and not the low-level de uh, details. Uh, so Rails is a framework, uh, mentioned Gowalla, is built on top of it. It's very uh, expressive, it's very, very easy to develop in. Um, it is not the quickest of languages, but um, in terms of actual runtime, with a trade-off that you as a developer can, can build things quicker and computers are cheap, uh, developers aren't. Okay. So some of the technologies that Rails utilizes, you might think, okay, well, I just want to learn Ruby on Rails. I don't want to learn any of this other stuff. Um, Rails is actually going to uh, generate HTML. We will be learning a little bit of that as we go along, as well as some, uh, some JavaScript in order to make our web applications a little bit more interactive. Um, CSS is the way we're going to make our web apps prettier. And uh, behind everything, Ruby is going to be uh, doing all of the generating and the heavy lifting. So, uh, welcome to Ruby. Uh, a little bit more in depth. This, this class isn't a Ruby class. Um, we will be learning Ruby alongside of Rails. Um, this section is just a quick kind of getting started. Uh, if you are interested in, in knowing more about Ruby, I would highly recommend um, Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby. It's a free way to pick up Ruby, or if you want something a little bit more encyclopedic and, and less quirky, um, the Programming Ruby book by Pragmatic Programmers, they also make the Agile Web Development with Rails book that you have now. Um, but that's not free. A lot of people were, will simply refer to that as pickaxe. Uh, if you were looking for something that really truly demonstrates how beautiful Ruby is uh, and everything you can you can do with it, um, also goes through a lot of the ways that Rails itself is built. Um, since Rails is written in Ruby, I highly highly recommend Metaprogramming Ruby. Um, this is not a beginner book. It doesn't start out just telling you you know, what an if statement is, what a, what a while statement is, um, basic data types. But if you can either, once we go through this class, you will be primed and ready to uh, go to Metaprogramming Ruby. Uh, so once you have your books, you might want to have a way to actually try your Ruby code. Um, if you go into your terminal or, or console, depending on uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, and you, t you can type in IRB and actually just dynamically run any Ruby code. All of the all of the Ruby code in the next couple of sections that I'm getting ready to show you um, is all valid. If you have any questions, since I'm going to be posting all of this online, um, you'll feel more than free uh, to come back, take a look at the slides, um, open up IRB, or for whatever reason you don't have Ruby on your computer or like you're at work and don't want to install it and want to goof off a little bit, then you can use tryruby.org, which gives you a nice uh, JavaScript kind of console, you can just type in there and it works exactly like uh, Interactive Console. Um, so Ruby strings are just characters, they're going to be surrounded by quotes. They're much the same in, uh, in many programming languages. We can do character substitution. Um, in this case, we are assigning a string of chunky bacon to food, um, and here food is a variable. And then we are outputting that to uh, the standard out using puts, which is a call. Um, and we're substituting food, so the output is, I'm hungry for uh, chunky bacon, which is delicious. Um, and then you can see here at the bottom, it's a little hard to read, 
but I'm hungry for chunky bacon dot class actually comes back and it says it is a string. So this is of the string class. Um, if you ever want to know what type of an object you're working with, everything inside of Ruby is going to be an object. Um, you can call dot class on it and it will tell you. It will tell you that, okay, we are a string class. Um, numbers, we have a couple of different types of numbers. We have uh, integers, which come in multiple flavors. They can show up as um, fixed nums, which is up at the top, or as if you get fixed nums so big, then they become big nums. Um, to you, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can do any kind of multiplication, division, subtraction, addition, um, without really having to worry about what data type you're using. Um, unless you are dividing two integers, in which case you will have to have, be using a, uh, a float. A float is anything that has a decimal number in it. Um, here we have 123.0, which Ruby understands that automatically by adding that point zero, we are using a float. Uh, in addition uh, to adding a, say, point zero, you can do things like if you, if, uh, if you multiply float, an integer by float, it will become a float. You can also call uh, 2f on an integer, and it will become a float. <clears throat> So we talked about symbols, uh, something else, or we talked about strings, something else you will definitely see and definitely utilize are symbols. Um, if you're familiar with other programming languages, uh, symbols are essentially immutable strings. It looks exactly like a string, uh, and you can even spell out words or spell out sentences as long as you don't have any kind of break. So we have um, A, B, uh, or Y the Lucky Stiff. Notice that Y the Lucky Stiff doesn't have any, any line breaks in it. Uh, the reason it's an Im immutable string is as soon as I say why the lucky stiff s and with an S on the end of it, that becomes a completely different symbol. Um, and here we can call uh, why the lucky stiff dot class and it returns symbol. There we go. Uh, one, a heavily uh, utilized data type it's very simple, simple, uh, similar to a, uh, a struct inside of C, is going to be a hash. A hash is going to have key value stores. Um, all of our parameters inside of Rails are going to be passed around in Ruby hashes. Uh, once you, you set your hash to a uh, variable, in this case we're assigning it to my var, uh, you can get back that, uh, the value by <coughs> passing in the key in parentheses. Um, so if we wanted to get uh, dog, for instance, we would pass in the word the uh, the key sup, um, or if we wanted to get bar, we would pass in in key. Uh, and again, we can see two class produces hashes. Um, can the key be any object type? So a key can be um, hat. It can be uh, symbols. It can also be strings. Um, I think that's it. And you can also convert. Uh, between the, if you call two options on a hash, it will convert all of the keys into symbols. So um, I believe the anything that can be converted into a symbol, you can convert a string into a symbol. Anything that can be converted into a symbol can be a uh, can be a key. All right. Um, next up, we have uh, Ruby arrays. Ruby arrays are going to be collections of objects, and these can be anything. In this case, I have one, two, three, four, but we could have strings. We can have symbols. Um, you can have an array of hashes. You can have a hash of arrays, like, you know, hey, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we do have a bunch of really handy operators on uh, these arrays. For instance, we can just call array.first, we'll get our the first element. We can call array.last, and anybody guess what that does? <laughs> um, like I said, Ruby's very expressive, it's very easy to read, um, very easy to write. Arrays are going to be zero indexed. If instead of um, calling for the first element of the array, if you actually wanted to say, I want the element at um, and, uh, index, the first very first index, then you would say index zero. You'd call array and then bracket zero is going to return your first element. Or array bracket one is going to return the number two. Uh, so finally, uh, the last data type that I'm going to be introducing y'all to is uh, a block. Um, Ruby blocks are essentially anonymous functions. Uh, if you're familiar with a programming language that does anonymous functions, um, if not, don't worry about it. Uh, one of the nice things about blocks is, uh, well, so a block is code inside of curly braces. 
Um, puts hello is our code that is, is inside of this block. Um, and we are two times calling puts hello. Um, as I mentioned, it's extremely expressive. If I just went up to somebody and said, hey, if I two times puts hello, like, you know, what's my output? Like, they'd probably look at me really, really weird, but then they'd be able to say, hello, hello, if they really wanted to continue speaking to me. Um, this is something uh, Ruby utilizes a lot. Um, methods can take in blocks. Uh, they can also take in optional blocks, and we can store those and call those later, whenever we want. Um, they're very handy. If you, if you want to make your code, if you want to have uh, functions inside of your block that span multiple lines, you can use a do and an end, uh, and that's just a way to make it look a little bit nicer. If you are saying, reading this off to somebody, if you're coding with someone, you would probably say two times do puts hello, and you really wouldn't read the end, because that's not how people talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? Can the brackets actually be on multiple lines? Or no. Say what? If it's going to be on multiple lines, you have to do do and. No, no. Um, and yeah, and this is that subtlety of Ruby. Um, there are no, you might have noticed there's no semicolons. Like there's no n characters. Um, just as long as, as long as you have a do and an end, or as long as you have a curly bracket and an n curly bracket, it doesn't matter where they are. Um, as long as when it's interpreted and actually run, it doesn't cause. So there's no benefit. So uh, it's really readability. If you if you if you are really used to Java or JavaScript, maybe you might prefer to have the curly brackets. But um, you'll find as soon as you go um, a little bit more than one or two lines, it gets a little bit. Um, or if you start nesting blocks instead of blocks, it's a lot easier for your eyes uh, to actually see the do in the end. Um, just personal preference. Uh, blocks can also take um, take arguments. Uh, so these are going to be variables that are going to be surrounded by um, pipes, which is the perfectly vertical. Um, and whatever is is output um, from this element, so two dot times. If we if we just call that, it's going to output um, because things are zero indexed. It's going to call zero, and then it's going to call one. <clears throat> so if we basically pipe that to the variable i and then route it to our code, which is puts hello i, it's going to put hello 0, hello 1. Uh, does anybody have any questions on? Can you close over variables not defined in pipes? Say what? Can you, um, any variables that go into the blocks, they have to be defined in pipes? Or can you have no. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you can you can define variables inside of the blocks, and that it will uh, stay inside of that scope. Uh, well, depending on how it's called, but but yes, yes, you can define things. They don't all have to go through the pipes. The pipes is just a way to get. I'm sorry. I mean, variables that are described outside of the scope of the. Yes, that is that is correct as well. Um, they will have have access to those. Um, on the caveat, I mentioned you can like you can save functions and then and call them later. We can um, modify the closure. Yeah. All right. So that that's pretty much uh, all I'll be discussing in terms of um, of Ruby basics. There is a chapter, I believe it's um, three in the in the book that goes a little bit more hands on. Um, it does give you some things you can run. I highly recommend. Um, going through that, especially if anything I, I said today made you feel a little bit uncomfortable or, you know, hey, like, I didn't really fully understand what's going on. Um, also, you feel more than, more than welcome to, uh, to ask me any kind of questions. Or uh, if you're working through something that you don't quite understand, uh, you can bring it to class and I'll, I'll be definitely happy to help you out. Um, there's also some other uh, free Ruby materials online. I'll, I'll see if I can send out a link. But um, so now that we've gotten done with our Ruby section, our brief introduction to Ruby, uh, here's some reasons you might or might not actually want to use Rails. Uh, so previously we mentioned that Rails is going to be a little bit slower than some some other ways you might want to code um, code websites, and really it's kind of a cost benefit uh, analysis. Ruby is a interpreted scripting language which means it doesn't compile. So at, 
as it runs, um, the computer has to figure out what's going on. It has to do all those really fancy things like, um, you know, it's really nice to code and not have to put semicolons in there, but somebody has to do that work, whether it's you or it's the computer, um, to figure out what is the new line, what is the next section. Um, and with those performance trade-offs, um, you, you can write much prettier code, uh, much quicker, and there's a lot of things that we will get into with, uh, with Ruby and with Rails. Um, but the bright side is that computers are really cheap. Like you can just go to Amazon and spin up a computer, and if it's not enough, like you can spin up another one. And if that's not enough, I mean, you can just mm -hmm. like if you run out of computers and Amazon is like, you know, having to buy new servers, like that, you know, everybody's happy, really. Um, you or you might even want to start your own data stack. But uh, and 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 Rails can definitely scale. Um, there's several large websites built on Rails. Go all I mentioned. We have a million uh, plus users. We continue to grow. Um, so that's a little bit in terms of, of performance. One of the thing, one of the big things about uh, the Rails framework that either turns people off in terms of actually programming or um, or really gets them involved is it's a very opinionated framework um, and it's it's very quick moving. So. Um, whenever a new technology comes out or a new concept that is deemed to be best practices, it's deemed to be, hey, this is a really good idea, um, Rails is really quick to seize upon that and incorporate it into the next version of Rails. Um, they're also really quick to say, like, hey, guys, this one thing we did, we did it pretty good, but we can do it better. Um, so we're going to change the we're going to change the syntax. We're going to change how that works. Um, so moving making large moves across Rails, say from Rails 2 to Rails 3, um, sometimes not the easiest thing in the world. Um, they are getting a little bit better at it, um, but you know that's something to, to uh, a cost-benefit analysis. Do you want to just build it once and you know, never, ever, ever have to take a look at it? Um, you know, if you, say, pick PHP, uh, like PHP 5 is probably not going anywhere, um, versus if you pick Rails, um, you will, and you want somebody to maintain an older version of Rails, you don't plan on continuously developing it. Um, you, you, you push out a version um, that is, that's just a, con a consideration, is, is will people remember how to work on, um, you know, Rails 1.0? I personally think I choose Rails. I like, I like fun new toys. Um, I also like the, the best that the web has to offer. So a little bit about Rails architecture. Um, some of the things that, as I mentioned, they are an opinionated framework. Uh, some of the opinions of the, the people that developed it uh, really insisted on um, dry convention over configuration, as well as utilizing uh, MVC stack, um, ORMs, and having a RESTful application. Um, you know, these are kind of terms that get thrown around just a lot, uh, especially in the first couple of chapters of the book. And, like, I mean, I think they get defined once. So, uh, dry is don't repeat yourself. Um, it seems to kind of make sense. You don't want to reduplicate work, but it is a little bit more complicated when it comes to code. Um, <clears throat> it can be really tempting to say, okay, well, I have a problem. I'm just going to go out and I'm going to write code and I'm going to solve it. Um, and then, you know, the next day a new problem comes up and you say, all right, well, I'm going to write code, I'm going to solve it. And then at the end of the week you realize, oh, wait, you know, maybe those two, two problems were actually the same thing. Uh, we could have used a little bit, we could have made our code a little bit more reusable um, and, and more flexible. Um, Rails really, really emphasizes keeping all of your, uh, your code dry. Um, and some of the ways that they do this is by having predefined organizations and also predefined... Um, uh, a, a predefined architecture. So if you find yourself um, constantly doing the same things over and over and over again, um, then there's probably a really good chance that you could do it differently and or better. Um, so convention over configuration is also something that Rails really, really embraces. Uh, whenever you first start Rails, uh, you, you get it on your computer and you can type Rails new and the name of the project. Um, and you already have a working website at that point in time. It, it generates you know, e you know, everything you need, um, providing you have all the, all the dependencies installed on your computer, and you can just start up a server. Um, part of the 
the reason it does that is because Rails assumes things. Um, Rails assumes um, that you don't mind starting off with a SQLite database. Um, but it also says, okay, well, you know, maybe if you want to use Postgres or, or MySQL um, or you, some other database, you can, you can switch that over later. But for the most part, if you're just getting started with Rails, you might not even know what a database is. Um, you can just run this command and, and hit the ground running. Um, so the, the <coughs> key concept of this is we're going to try to decrease the number of decisions you need to make um, up front in order to um, speed up development. And we're not going to trade off flexibility either. You can go back after the fact. Um, earlier I mentioned that Rails was built on an MVC architecture. Uh, MVC stands for Model View Controller. This is not something that is specific to Rails. Uh, this is used in a, in a wide number of things. Um, the more you can learn about it with Rails, the better. Uh, basically, we want to split up all of our logic between what our code is actually going to do. If our code is going to be involved with something that you actually view, something, something that you're rendering, um, we are going to associate that code with a view. If, it, if it's business logic, um, you know, somebody sends us a web request and we want to figure out, okay, what action should we now perform? That's, um, that's uh, well, that's business logic. That's going to go in a controller and um, reusable class logic is all going to go in, inside of a model. Uh, but essentially, all uh, whenever the user hits your hits your website, they're going to hit all three of these. They all combine together to become a superpower of um, generating website awesomeness. Um, the user is going to um, hit your server. It's going to be directed to the controller. The controller is going to talk to your model. The model is going to talk back to the controller. Finally, it's going to hit your view. Everything's going to be rendered. Um, and that's going to be spit out as a glorious web page. Um, and you know, hopefully this will be done really, really, really quick. Um, and also many, many, many times making you lots and lots and lots of money. Um, so uh, it, a model, in this case, is, is actually a model of a thing. Um, it's bad to describe something with its own definition. Um, for instance, we, if we have a, uh, a web application that you'll be doing shopping, uh, most likely you'll have a shopping cart. Um, so you'll actually have a shopping cart model because that is a thing in your application. Um, and if you put things, so a, a, a shopping cart should be able to check out in a website. Um, so you can put that kind of logic inside of your model versus you don't want to say a shopping cart uh, renders somebody's name as red. Um, that's definitely kind of view logic. So by default, whenever you first create Rails, you, you um, enter in the command Rails new and then the name of your project. Um, it is going to go ahead and it's going to spit out uh, a whole bunch of empty files. It's going to generate um, an application folder. And in that application folder, you're going to have a controller folder, a model folder, and a view folder. Um, all of these folders are connected automatically. So if you create a, um, a carts controller um, and you have an action inside of that carts controller and that action is called show, whenever um, somebody hits your website and says, I want the show action, then um, Rails is smart enough to say, okay, well, we're, we're already in the carts controller. Let's just go into the carts folder and look for show.html.erb. Um, and all of the all of your view files will be HTML.erb. Um, it's it's very similar to HTML, except they are using a ERB preprocessor. Um, and ERB is um, a way that Ruby can output HTML, basically. Um, so yeah, we can have multiple view. We can actually have multiple views per controller, and we can tell it um, to render two different views, but. Uh, DHH, which is the founder, uh, he originally coded up the first version of Rails, worked for 37 Signals, um, has said a couple of times that Rails' strongest benefit is um, creating blank files and blank folders. Um, so no matter what project I go to, I know <laughs> relatively where the code is going to be. Um,
Um, previously touched a little bit on models, or just mentioned that we're using models. Um, Rails is going to be using database-backed models. Um, if you're not familiar with a database, if you've never used one, if you don't even know what it is, well, uh, it's a way to store a lot of data. Um, we, can, we have many different types of databases, but for the most part, Rails tries to keep you as far away from the data database as possible. Um, you, you don't really need to know a lot, but you do need to know a little bit. Um, inside of a database, we are going to need, need to tell it how we're going to organize our data. Um, you can put a lot of data into a database. You can also query it and take a lot, of, a lot of data out. And we have to tell our database how we want it to store the things we're putting in and retrieve the things we're taking out. Uh, so inside of databases, things are organized into tables. Um, so in this instance, we actually have a users table. And the users table is going to uh, be mapped to our user model. Uh, so the user table is, is um, I really hate using this analogy, but the, the, a not bad way of thinking about it is it's a uh, sheet inside of Excel. Um, and inside of our users table, we're going to have different columns. And these columns all have a name and a type. Um, and additionally, they can have a modifier. So a name inside of our users column might be hometown, or it might be username. Um, and the type in each one of those is probably going to be string. You know, we also might have, have age, and that type might be, um, might be an integer. Uh, and that's that, all of that is, is the schema of a database. This is kind of the skeleton, um, really how the database is, uh, knows where to put things. Um, when you actually get to putting data into your database and taking it out, you will be creating rows and getting data from rows. Um, so I, I mentioned that, or the title of the slide is actually database back models. Um, Rails uses databases in order to store attributes for your, your, for your models. So if we have a user's table, and this user's table has a hometown, um, then we have a, we can have a user object and that user can have a method of hometown and we can call user.hometown um, and Rails will automatically go and uh, look into the database uh, and it will write some, I'm sorry, you cannot see that at all. Um, it will write some SQL. SQL is a structured query language. It's a way that databases, uh, or that you communicate with databases. Um, when you write, or some people also call it SQL, um, and I guess since you can't really see it, I can read it off. It's uh, select star from book where price is greater than 100.00, order by title. Um, although it reads pretty, pretty easily, um, we can get into some you know, really, really nasty, um, or, or, I mean, depending on who you are and who you're talking to, um, complicated things. Uh, in terms of queries and inserting, um, but Rails mostly says you don't necessarily need to, the more you know about um, SQL, the better, but you don't necessarily need to. Um, as long as you know that a database exists, that your models are backed by this database, um, and that inside of this database we can um, insert, we can query, we can update, and we can delete those models, um, then we're, we're pretty much good to go because Rails uses object relational mapping. Um, almost nobody ever calls it object, object relational mapping just because that's a really long phrase. Um, everybody just says ORM. Um, and what an ORM does, it, it maps a Ruby object. In this example, we have um, a user, and we are calling where on it and passing in uh, a name of Bob. So we're, we're saying, give me the user uh, that has a name of Bob. Um, and Rails is going to take this little piece of Ruby code and it's going to generate this larger piece of SQL. It's going to send that off to our database. The database is going to say, okay, hey, SQL, I, I know how to respond. Um, it's going to actually get that data and return it to uh, where it was called from. Um, in this case, we are setting that user, once we find it, to a user variable. Um, once we have that user variable, we can just call dot name on it, and we get Bob returned, if it exists in the database. Uh, 
And it's nice because you only ever really have to deal with Ruby code. Um, also, an, another nice uh, benefit is since Rails out of the box supports uh, many, many different types of databases, uh, you can switch your, the type of database that you're using and you don't have to change the way you're generating SQL. Because di some, some different databases do speak slightly different versions of uh, SQL and you know, that, can be, that can be pretty bad uh, to try to keep up with that. Um, so with ORM, we're going to be using that, the database backed models. Um, the, the way that Rails knows that we have this object, this user object, um, is we're going to put it in our models and we're going to create a file called user.rb. Um, and this is a little bit of a convention over configuration. We, Rails says, all right, user.rb inside of models, well, you should define what a user is based on the name of the file. Um, inside of it, we have a class. We're generating this class uh, called user, and um, it is in inheriting from active record base, um, which is what that weird kind of syntax means. Um, active record base is Rails ORM. You don't really need to know that, uh, or active record is, but uh, if somebody ever asks you, there you go. You can also switch out the um, object relational mapper inside of Rails if you ever choose to. Um, and what active record will do, it says, all right, now I'm, I'm part of this user object. So somewhere there's got to be a database that has a user's table. Um, and if I, if I do something um, like, say, where name is equal to Bob, um, it knows to go ahead and look in, in the user's table. Any, any questions about that? So, either you. Um, the kind of the, the, the secondary uh, to Active Record is one called Data Mapper. Um, it was created by a guy named Uticats. Um, and Uticat, I don't know if he still manages it or not. Um, all of this is, is open source technology. I, I guess I failed to mention that at the beginning. Um, Rails is 100% completely open source. You can go download and install on your computer. Um, you can hack on it. Um, I actually got a patch uh, submitted and uh, accepted to Rails 3.1, so I'm a Rails contributor. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Data Mapper is, I've used it a little bit, and it's great because it allows you to do some more complicated things that Active Record um, doesn't as easily, but it, it's just kind of a different paradigm. Um, so, what's mostly used, like Active Record? Oh, yeah. I, I just use Active Record. Um, Mostly because everybody just uses Active Record. Um, yeah, um, Gowalla uses. Uh, we use Active Record, and um, the database we use is Postgres. I mentioned there's a whole different number of databases. Um, in terms of picking a database, there's a lot of things to be considered. Um, if you're just getting started off, um, it really doesn't matter. Most of them are about the same, but. Um, you know, when you get into scaling bigger and bigger and you need to do um, production maintenance on a database, say, well, it's up and, and lots of people are hitting it, um, all of them have slightly different features. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, slave masters and slaves, whenever you get to a bigger um, architecture, you'll probably want to have one database um, for writes and then a whole bunch of other databases for reads. And all these slave databases just look at your master. Um, but, I, I mean, for getting started, I recommend Active Record. Uh, if you ever are using something, Sinatra, I think, uses, is, a, is a very trimmed down version of Rails. Um, and it uses uh, Data Mapper by default, I believe. But, yeah. Both of them are valid. It's really just personal preference. I like Active Record. Um, so, I guess. To beat this to a pulp, uh, where is going to be this method that, that automatically looks in the user table? <clears throat> That's pretty much it for object relational mapping. Um, the last bit of Rails architecture I'm going to talk about is uh, representational state transfer. Uh, everybody's just going to call this REST because, again, representational state transfer is a mouthful. Um, representa representational state transfer, or REST, is 
a way to say that how you say messages matter. And it's very true in real life. If you say something to someone with a smile versus a frown, um, it can carry very different context, although you say the exact same thing. Um, and while computers don't necessarily understand how you inflect the tone of your voice, unless you're maybe Google Voice or Talk or something, um, they servers do speak a language. Um, and this language is HTTP. Uh, it's going to have different action words. And the, the action words or methods are um, get, put, post, and delete. Those are, those are your primary ones. We can have uh, some other HTTP methods, uh, but mostly this is what we're going to be sticking to. Um, and what we're saying by a RESTful web service is if, our, um, if we ask for a piece of information with a git versus we ask for a piece of information with a post, those are actually two completely separate things. Um, by default, uh, git maps to your index, show, and new actions. Um, put is your update, delete, kind of makes sense, it's mapped to your destroy. Um, and post is going to be mapped to create. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with HTTP verbs, um, don't worry, most browsers kind of hide it from you. Uh, a git, or an example of a git is just typing in a web address. So gowalla.com, google.com, all of those are just going to be git requests. You're, you're just saying, get me information from the server. Um, a, a post, you're pushing information to a server. Um, and that might be you're entering a credit card in a form, or you're, you're signing up for a web application. Um, one, one difference is uh, inside of a git, you're actually passing information inside of the a parameter string in the URL. That's whenever you, you go to Google and you, you type in something, you search for something, and then it, the URL you know, turns into this <coughs> big, nasty thing. Um, versus whenever you type your credit card into a field and you hit enter, you don't want to see your credit card number <laughs> go in the web URL. That, that would be kind of bad. Um, so they, they also do have a little bit of security associated with using different methods. Any questions about... All right, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your work environment, how you might want to want to set that up. Um, going to touch on version control. If you've never heard of version control or you've never used it, don't worry about it. Um, Ruby Gems, um, as well as Bundler, RVM, and um, my personal favorite, testing. I love tests. Uh, so version control. What what is version control? Um, as you're writing your code, uh, you might be really tempted to do this. Um, like I definitely know I've written some Word docs where it's like, okay, I swear this is really the last one. But um, just don't do that. Uh, we do have a version control software out there, um, and even recently, Word documents. If you open one up, it'll say, hey, which which revision did you want to like? Did you want to open? Did you want to open from five minutes ago? Did you want to open the saved version? So even, even Word documents are kind of catching up. Um, but as a coder, we do have uh, very sophisticated version control products. Um, and version control is a way to um, make note of what is different, what you, what you changed since last time. Um, you're going to actually take code and modify it and then say, all right, I, I meant to modify this. I'm going to save it instead of saving it as underscore one, um, you're actually going to commit it to your version control, um, and the version control is going to keep track of uh, what is different between those. Um, it's really nice. You can actually go back in time if you need to switch to an older version of your, of your code. Uh, maybe a major bug is introduced into your website, um, and you need to you know, roll back the, the last week's worth of changes and, uh, until you can figure out what's going on. Um, you can do that relatively easy with uh, version control. It's very simple to see um, what was modified, when it was modified, who modified it. Um, it's also very simple to use version control with a team. Um, just a little diagram, and, and we use version control at Goala. We use a uh, something called Git as well as GitHub, um, and we'll get a little bit more. Have a screenshot of GitHub coming up. Um, and right now we have um, about s seven people actively. Um, working on the exact same code base, 
uh, we all just push it to a repository and whenever you need to make uh, uh, pull in somebody else's changes basically you're always syncing with a, a repository and this is this is your um, your gold master if you will um, and so as long as everybody's in sync with the repository, you're good to go. If there's any kind of conflicts in the file that you're changing, um, your version control system will prompt you and say, hey, you and Jim Bob modified the same file, and you actually modified the same line. So you need to figure out uh, which one should go in there. <clears throat> We've got quite a few different types of version control. Um, I recommend Git. Uh, hands down, it's my favorite, um, and mostly because of GitHub. Um, which is, it's a website where you can actually, they will host a Git repository for you. They also have a lot of really neat tools. Um, it's very nice. A uh, second runner-up is Subversion. A lot of people use Subversion. Um, I personally, I've, I've used it in very, very limited cases, but never with a team. Um, so I can't really compare or contrast uh, too much. Um, I know a lot of people who use con uh, Subversion say it's difficult making merges. Uh, there's also Mercurial, Perforce, and you can get in some major, major debates with people over, like, what version controls the best? But they all lose because it's Git. <laughs> um, so here's a screenshot of um, GitHub. Uh, I guess it is a little difficult to see. This is a screenshot from an open source project I have called KeyBuilder. Um, you can go to github.com slash schneems, which is my username, and check out KeyBuilder. You can download it, hack on it. And um, in this commit, um, I just changed one file, so we only have one file listed. It's keybuilder.rb. And um, in green, in this insanely light green that you can't really see, um, those are the, the lines that I added. And in red, those are the lines that, that I took out. Um, also, when I committed this, um, I, I specified some sort of a message that's not listed here that says, kind of gives you some sort of an explanation as to why. Um, you know, why did this code change as a, you know, um, if, if code changes, it generally needs to have a reason. If it doesn't have a reason, then you have a problem. Um, it's also a really good way to make sure that you're only changing what you needed to change. Um, before I, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm working at work, and sometimes I try out a lot of different things to see, okay, what works, what doesn't. Um, when you get into that situation, you might accidentally uh, put in a constant instead of you know, doing uh, some sort of a variable lookup, um, or do some make some really really bad practices just for the purpose of purposes of temporarily debugging in a local environment. Um, whenever you use a tool like Git, or um, there's also another one for uh, OS X called uh, Git X, it will give you a view like this before you even submit these changes. Before you you say this is what I want on this repository. It'll show you a view kind of similar to this, and it's going to say, hey, by the way, did you realize you modified these lines? Did you actually want to do this? And you can pick individual lines and say, yes, I meant to modify this. We're, we're going to go ahead and pass this on to everybody else. Um, so highly recommend Git. Highly recommend GitHub. Any questions on that? And GitHub is a very thriving, uh, thriving community. Um, a, a lot of, oh, and also GitHub was built on Ruby on Rails, so... Give, give some love. Um, but there's tons of open source. You can, you can open up a free account as long as all of your repositories are public. Um, and that's to try and encourage open source, uh, open source code. Rails is hosted on GitHub, so it's kind of weird. Like, GitHub's built on Rails, but Rails now uses GitHub. Like, there's a lot of kind of fun open source things like that. Um, one thing that we will be using a lot of inside of Rails uh, is Ruby Gems. Ruby Gems is not a Rails only thing, um, but we do use it extensively. Um, gems are basically external code packages, and this is going to be code that um, someone else wrote. It can be solving a very common problem. Um, I mentioned I wrote one called Keytar that builds um, strings for key value lookups. Um, Somebody built one that's really cool called OmniAuth. You, you can include OmniAuth in your code, and if you have a website that has users and you don't want them to have to like fill out a form, um, then OmniAuth gives you a way that you can uh, present them with, say, a Facebook button, and they can just click that Facebook button, and bam, you know, now they have a user account. Or OmniAuth also integrates with Gowalla. Um, 
So, uh, so that's what a gem is. It's these external code packages generally solving a very common thing. Um, Ruby gems is going to be the package that manages and keeps track of all of these different packages. Um, so you, your operating system, if you have a Mac, um, already has Ruby gems on it. You might, you might have to install it. Otherwise, if you're using Windows or, um, or Linux, but once you have it on there, you can just do get, uh, gem install and then the name of your gem. It'll automatically go and it'll hit a server where they have, uh, have these managed packages um, and, it, and it'll pull it down and it'll install it on your system. Um, and by install it on your system, it basically just puts it in a directory and you can actually go and, and, and look at that directory later. You can type in um, <coughs> gem env and it'll tell you exactly where it's putting them. Uh, so once we have these installed to your system, you can go into a Ruby console um, by typing in IRB. You can require Ruby gems, which um, <clears throat> will then enable you to do other things like require the gems that you've installed on your system, such as Kitar. Uh, Rails is actually distributed as a as a Ruby gem. Um, you have to, in order to get Rails installed, you have to say gem install Rails. Um, also, I mentioned that Rails is, is highly flexible. We talked about being able to switch in, act, say, Active Record for Data Mapper. Um, you would do that by, you would need to have the Data Mapper gem installed on your computer. That's how you would actually get Data Mapper. Um, does anybody have any questions on this? All right. That is a really good introduction into um, one of Rails, Rails 3's newer features, uh, which is Bundler. Bundler is a way to manage all of these dependencies, all of these gems, all of these packages. Um, anybody can create a package, anybody can, can name it whatever they want as long as it's not already taken. Um, and the more confusing part of this is in those packages they can require other code. Um, for instance, uh, when I first wrote Kitar, it required another library called Active Support. Um, and active support is also required by using Rails. So, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm requiring the same library, possibly different versions, but just running the same code. It, it can be really, really difficult to, to, um, to manage those and say, all right, this is one version that satisfies all of, all of those criteria. Um, so you actually can put um, Bundler on your system, and Bundler will manage those dependencies for you. Um, as I mentioned, Rails, the Rails ecosystem does have this kind of recursive um, uh, set of tools. Uh, you install Bundler by doing gem install Bundler. Um, and then once you have Bundler installed, you use Bundler to manage your gems. So it's, it's kind of, yeah. Um, once you have Bundler installed, inside of your Rails file or your Rails project, you're going to have a gem file. Um, in the gem file, you're going to say where you're looking for these gems. In this case, we're going to be looking for um, them in Ruby gems, and you're also going to list out all of the gems that you're going to need. Um, and before Rails starts up, um, Bundler is going to take a look at all of these in individual gems. It's going to take a look at Rails. <clears throat> it's going to take a look at Unicorn. It's going to take a look at Kitar, and it's going to say, "All right, now all of you, tell me what you need, and I'm going to try and like make you all play play well together." Um, once you once you put these things in one file, uh, you can specify specific versions if you if you really need. Um, I would highly recommend locking down your version of Rails. Um, otherwise, um, if you you can install gems using Bundler, um, and if you don't specify a version, say we just have gem Kitar with no version, um, it will automatically look for the most recent version of the gem, which is sometimes good. Uh, sometimes you might not want that. You can also specify you want a, a version of less than this, or greater than this, or kind of about this. Um, I use the kind of about this operator quite a bit. Uh, once you have all of your your gems, um, oh, and kind of about this just means there you can support minor version changes, but if it if a major version changes, um, it won't install that. Uh, generally, minor versions are just like minor like patches, bug fixes, speed updates whereas major versions might be a complete API overhaul. So you wouldn't want to introduce that into your system whenever you run bundle um, install. Um, running bundle install will actually go through that gem file, take a look at all of the individual gems, and um, 
see okay which which versions of these um, are you, do you need what of their dependencies do you need um, and also do you have them on the system if you don't have them on the system then it's going to go ahead and install that uh, the beautiful beautiful part of this is um, in order to utilize a gem inside of Rails, it actually has to be in this gem file. Um, so if you are using external code, it has to be in this gem file. And the beautiful part about that is if you then have to go and put it on a server, which if you want people to actually go and view your website, um, that server is going to have to also have that same dependency. And by putting it in the gem file, the server knows exactly uh, what, uh, what code you were using locally in order to run. Um, it also means anybody else on your team uh, has access to the exact same code that, that you had. Uh, it's kind of a way to standardize. Any questions on Bundler? All right. Now, this is a um, RVM is the Ruby ver <coughs> version manager. It's definitely possible to program um, Ruby and Rails without it, uh, though I do recommend it. The best way to describe RVM is it's a sandbox. If you are using multiple, uh, if you have multiple projects, um, you might be, one of your projects might be written in Ruby 1.8.7. Another one might be written in Ruby 1.9.2. Um, RVM is a way that instead of using our system specified uh, version of Ruby, like a global version of Ruby, it's going to say, all right, we're creating a special little environment for you. Um, and this environment, you can do whatever you want. It's not going to modify the global environment. Um, the real benefit of using RVM comes from gem sets. <clears throat> you can create a gem set, and um, we talked about Ruby gems. We talked about installing Ruby gems um, and, and using it with Bundler. Uh, typically, if you did that without RVM installed, it would install those to a one central system-wide directory. Um, which is, is not a really good idea um, because whenever you run something like Rails, uh, if, you, if you type in Rails on the console, it will run the most recent version of Rails you have. So if you have one project that's on Rails 2 point whatever and another one on 3 point whatever, if you go into a Rails uh, 2.0 project and you start typing in Rails commands, it's going to be running Rails 3.0, which is bad. Um, so you can create these gem sets, uh, and this gem set is a project-specific um, sandbox. Um, any, if, if you uh, go into your system, even if you have a ton of gems already installed, and you type in RVM gem set create hello or foo, um, and then you type in gem list, it, there, it'll be blank. There's going to be nothing in there. Um, it's a completely blank slate. Um, then if you run your bundler or if you install any gems, it will populate that gem set. Uh, it's also another way to kind of um, make sure that it's nice to use RVM with Rails because of uh, using it with multiple projects, but also even without Rails, it's nice to use it um, in that it gives you 100% complete, uh, complete uh, clean slate and you can, you can do things like simulate installing things on a, on a nether system. Uh, simulate installing your, your dependencies on another system. So whenever you switch projects, you switch gem sets. Uh, and we can talk about uh, RVM a little bit more uh, in a later, later class. Uh, so almost the last thing I want to talk about is testing. Um, this is built into Rails. Rails is going to have a default uh, testing framework. Uh, but what is testing and why might you want to do it? Uh, everybody writes code. Well, you all do. Congratulations. Now you are all coders by attending this class. Um, but you need to know what your code did and um, will it still work? And we can answer both of those questions um, by writing tests. Uh, well, there's two different types of tests. We can either test manually. You can go to your form. You can enter in information and you can also hit submit. Um, but you can imagine that if you had to do that every single time you updated anything on your website, um, that's a lot of typing, that's a lot of submitting. Uh, we can also write code that tests our own code. Um, and this is the type of a testing framework that Rails utilizes. Um, if you get in the habit of um, either doing something um, called test-driven development, which is you write your tests before you even write your code, you say, this is how I want my code to behave, um, and then you write your 
code to actually go through and make that test green, um, then you never really have to worry about this. Uh, it actually ends up saving time in the long run. It might, it might sound like you're duplicating the amount of code you have to run, but if you are writing something that truly does, um, that you actually care about, you, you, you care about the output of this function or this website, um, and you know what you want that output to be, um, then you can write a test for it. Uh, you can swap in other test frameworks, and you can also use uh, continuous integration, uh, which is uh, the concept that you have a machine running your, uh, your production environment, um, and its sole purpose in life is to test your code. If you write, write tests for your code, and you submit it with using version control to a repository, um, this computer says, all right, well, hey, there's new things. Now I'm going to run all the tests and, and make sure that they're all green. Um, uh, if you if you test your code very well, you keep all of and you keep all of your tests green. Then um, then you know whenever you deploy something that your whole service isn't going to go down. Um, if you do end up have, getting into an exceptional situation where uh, something breaks, uh, users start complaining about something. Um, the first thing you should probably do is go back and write a test saying this is how to reproduce this. Let's make sure that it never ever ever happens again. Uh, so that is testing. Um, another common question are how do I how do I write Ruby? How do I write Rails? Um, I personally use TextMate for the Mac. Um, I've also used Notepad Plus Plus if you have a Windows machine, um, or I use Eclipse with a Aptana Rad Rails plugin. There's plenty other ones, um, and um, I think uh, somebody said they were using Ruby Mine earlier. Was that Ruby Mine? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Just commercial. You have to buy. Yeah. Um, it's so, a free trial. Awesome. So yeah, uh, feel free. Definitely talk to one another. If somebody, if you end up loving Ruby Mine, you're like, hey, this is great. Like, try and show it around. Um, show it off to me. And um, yeah, uh, the Rails community is one of the best parts of Rails. Rails and Ruby. Um, I haven't really met many Ruby developers. Um, none come to mind that were just mean. Like most people uh, <laughs> love talking about what they do. They want Ruby to be more successful. They want Rails to be more successful. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention earlier uh, is there's tons of people hiring for Rails right now. There's uh, tons and tons of opportunities around Austin especially. Um, and that's a really, really good thing. It's also a really bad thing. It's good for you because you're going to know Rails and you're going to be highly sought after. Um, but it's also kind of bad because if we have um, too many people that are uh, in need of Rails developers and not enough Rails developers, then those people are going to switch to other technologies. Um, and if you're using something that's not Rails, then you know that just makes me sad. Um, uh, so yes, also a plug for Austin on Rails. Uh, they meet the fourth... Um, Thursday of every single month, it's a great way to get in, involved with the community. Even if you don't know anything, you can show up, you can learn something. Sometimes like people talk about crazy things that I don't even understand. Um, the best part is that there's always, uh, there's always beer afterwards. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes it's free, sometimes we get companies to come in and pay for it. Um, but, uh, you know, don't stay silent. There's a ton of um, opportunities like that. And even on the internet, uh, if you have a question, I highly recommend Stack Overflow. I've gotten a lot of good, uh, good response from that. Um, if you ask a question and you don't get an answer, uh, you know, ask it again. Like there's, there's no harm. There's no reputation on the internet, no matter what Facebook tries to tell you. Um, does anybody have any questions? With that version control, yes. obviously, I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of like your actual Ruby code and then also maybe a database you're working with. Mm -hmm. is, that, I mean, is there a whole different deal when it comes to version control and a database, making sure that you can go back in time and see thing? So, yes. The... Um, you, 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 would, you would put... Really bad code something, and it goes to in your database. Yeah. Uh, you would put all of your... You would version control all of your Ruby code, um, and your your database. Um, you mostly only want to ver uh, version things that are 
um, human changed. Like they, they, if the if the data changes, it's for a specific reason. Um, so if you change your code, then that's for a specific reason. But if you change your database, that just means it's good. You have users, right? Um, so with your database, instead of keeping that inversion control, there are other ways to um, to back up your database, and that's probably what you're going to want to do. Like uh, every night, you're going to probably uh, have your systems administrator, or if you use some sort of a service like Heroku. Um, which which does these kind of things? Um, you can you can just dump your database, basically making an exact copy of it. Uh, so if something in your code goes wrong um, and ends up wiping all of the information off of your database, which it, it's pretty hard to do, I've tried. Um, then you do have a backup. You know, it is a, it it is a timestamp backup. It's not a hundred percent perfect backup, but you know, it's a lot better than nothing. Yes. So um, as far as the schema goes, um, Rails does provide us, and we're going to cover this or start talking about it in the next class, but um, it's called migrations. Um, Rails provides us with a way to specify and say, this is exactly the schema that we want. Um, and not only can we apply this to the database, but we can also go the other way. We can say, oh, yeah, we didn't actually want it to look like that. So we'll, we'll take that back. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Any, anything else? Does uh, does GitHub have like a code review system? So like if I write really shitty code and I want someone else to look at it, is there a place like on GitHub to do that, or is that something that you'd have to do internally? Um, so yes and no. Um, if you're working on something with a team, um, there is something called. Uh, there's a there's a process called git flow which um, basically anytime you need to make a change to code you create a new branch um, and don't worry some of the terminology is a little little fuzzy but you just basically copy the code over to a new version and you make all of your changes and then instead of going ahead and merging it back and saying okay I meant to make all these changes um, you can issue a pull request and that's going to notify everybody on your team. It's really nice, actually. Um, GitHub gives you the ability to do like inline <coughs> comments, and um, at the bottom, like you can just have global comments. Uh, uh, and and we do this. We follow uh, kind of this Git flow. Um, and if somebody wants something reviewed, that's how they do it. Okay. Uh, and if I see that code and I like it, then I give it. I just say plus one. Um, otherwise, I comment directly on it and say why I didn't like it. Um, there's also something called GitHub issues. Where you can you can submit um, kind of bugs um, to d uh, different code, and um, yeah. Also, you know, if if you're using GitHub and it is open source, then anybody anybody can see it, um, which is nice. If your library becomes intensely popular, people will start writing code for you. I mean, that's that's awesome. Um, yeah, awesome. Um, so I think we are a little over time. Um, I'm going to be walking over to, uh, to JT's Java, uh, so if you all want to kind of pack up, if you're interested in coming, if not, um, definitely, it was nice meeting all of you all. Um, I'll send out uh, some assignments for next week in terms of, um, of course material. Um, thank you, thank you for coming. Thanks. Oh, and, and, and also, I did want to mention, um, I, have, I have Ethan here, uh, he's in the back, he's wearing, wearing a tie. Um, he's a Ruby professional, and if you if you have any uh, any questions, he'll be uh, he'll helping out with any kind of install issues um, or just questions in general. Thanks. Thank you. If I had internet, I'd show you what like the issues and pull requests look like. Yeah. Pretty popular these days. I haven't used GitHub yet.